Good morning. No, you're not used to seeing me standing in this spot, nor am I used to standing in this spot. Um, try to get my things all situated here. Bringing something in I wasn't anticipating bringing in, so having to make room for it. For those of you who have been on uh, here on Wednesday nights for last three Sunday uh, Wednesdays, we've uh, that pen down there. It's been my bookmark, and I keep dropping it. Kept dropping it then, and about dropped it now. I thought I'm just going to put it on the floor that way, just avoid it can't fall if it's down there. So um, I'm going to pray for a minute. Father, I want to uh, just surrender. As, as this song has said, I want to surrender myself to you. Not for just this hour that I have to speak, but um, forever. Lord, you have redeemed us, and we are not our own. And Lord, that's one of the things we're going to look at today. Um, just ask that you would open our hearts to hear what you want to say. Lord, anything that I say that is is um, wrong, off the wall, please um, show me so I can correct it or um, put it in the hearts of the people to know it's, it's, it's not right. Um, either way, Lord, I ask that you glorify yourself today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Uh, want to talk this morning about worship. Um, there are probably a thousand or more different lessons or teachings um, that could be taught on this subject. And... This is, I believe, the one that God has said, this is what I want you to do. Um, it's a perspective that has been on my heart for a long time um, and just started putting it all down on paper, uh, I guess, about a week and a half ago. Um, so what I want to, first of all, look at is what is worship? Um, I, I guess it's, um, is it the, the media, the uh, reporters, they ask questions, who, what, when, where, why, how, all that. So I asked the Lord, I said, what outline do you want me to use? And that's what he said. So, oh, okay. So that's what I'm doing. Um, it's, it's not in the typical order that people would normally use in forming a a story or uh, article, but this is um, the way I, the order I believe it should be in for what I'm doing anyway. Um, so, what is worship? We all may have different ideas, different connotations of what worship is. Um, you can ask anybody what their idea is, and you probably get something different from everybody. Um, what uh, I want to consider, though, is what's God say ab about it, and uh, we're going to go to his, his word for that. Um, so some people would call what we're doing here a worship ser service. Um, some would say that the song part of the service is worship. We're going to lead worship. I'm a worship leader. I have kind of moved away from calling it worship because we'll get into this more deeply as we go, but is it, never mind, I won't go there yet. Um, it might be worship, it might not be. It is definitely songs. So we're singing songs. So I, I say I'm going to lead songs it's up 
to me and my heart, up to you and your hearts, whether or not you're going to worship. It's a perfect op- opportunity to look, look at these, these words. Um, last song we did, I'm giving you my heart and all that, it, that is within. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my king. I'm giving you my dreams, laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life. Uh, the previous song, Hungry. Hungry, I come to you, for I know you satisfy. I'm empty, and I know your love does not run dry. So I wait for you. I'm falling on my knees, offering all of me. Jesus, you're all this heart is living for. So some may, some may call what we're doing worship. Some may say that the whole thing is worship. Song time, teaching time, fellowship, everything is a form of, of worship. Um, some churches will have five or six, six to eight minute songs and because they've they and they believe they have reached heaven and are in fellowship with God because of all the emotions that has been stirred up in the people's minds and hearts. Um, and there are some that want a more lively service. They just want to be able to express themselves freely. And to them, that is worship. And there are some who appreciate the high church and the liturgy and all that goes along with that and say, that is worship. So which is it? It it could be all of it for those who are truly worshiping. Or it could be none of it. None of them for those who don't have a heart for God. So I want to, through this study, draw a distinction between what we call worship and actual worship. And that's kind of hard for me to do. So it took me, <laughs> I spent a lot of time on these notes. And I thought, I set it all aside last night. I'm done. Shut my computer, printed it off, then I shut my computer. I got, I, I, <laughs> I got up in the morning, this morning, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go read through it, make notes, cha- changes. I don't know if you can see the red. It's like that on every page. And so um, if, if I, it's, it's like, wait a minute, this section belongs here. I told Laura this morning, I wish I had another week just to be able to format this better, you know. So bear with me. I may have to flip some pages around to make it all make, make sense, at least in my mind. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to do is uh, consider what worship actually is. Dictionary definition. Reverent honor and homage paid to God or a sacred sacred personage or to any object regarding <laughs> regarded as worship. Wow, let me start over. That was terrible. <laughs> reverent honor and I'm not used to being up, up here, so give me a break. Uh, reverent honor and homage paid to God or a sacred personage or to any object regarded as sacred. So that's dictionary definition. Does that fit the biblical definition? Well, the Bible doesn't give a definition of it, but we can look at the Hebrew words and the Greek words to kind of get an idea of what, what, it, what, what it, does, it does mean. We can also look at God's commands to his people to be able to see what he means by worship. Okay, so we're going to... Uh, went to... The um, faithful blue letter Bible that's in my phone to, uh, let me just open this up so I got it. And I looked at the inner linear to get the, 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 the Greek and Hebrew words, and I'm not going to try to pr- pronounce them. Um, but the Old Testament Hebrew word for worship, and it's not worship. It's some Hebrew word that we have translated into worship, okay? 
So it's basically to bow down, to prostrate yourself, to show honor to, um, to humbly cry out or to show reverence. The Greek word from the New Testament that they use for worship is always translated wor- worship. Uh, the, the Old Te- Testament is, is translated worship, bow down, prostrate, every many different kinds of, m- many different, different ways. Uh, New Testament translation is always worship. Um, so, with that in mind, what I'd like to do is have you turn to Exodus. The book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. This is our first look into what God may mean by worship. After that, we're going to go to chapter 23 of Exodus. When giving the law to his people, this is Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5, second commandment, you shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. In Exodus 23, verses 24 and 25, give you a second to get there. When warning his people about going into the promised land, he said, Verse 24, you shall not worship their gods, nor serve them, nor do any, nor do according to their deeds, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their sacred pillars in pieces, but you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove your sickness from your midst. What I want to see in this passage is that word serve. <clears throat> there is a definite and a consistent connection between the word worship and serve throughout the script, script, scripture. We'll look a little bit of that in, at, uh, at Paul as well. Let me go, go ahead and hit there now. Paul as well, several times when he's telling people about what he does and who he is, he's, he talks about him serving the Lord, the God, the creator of all, all, all things. So he's ser- serving. He doesn't say worship. He says, I serve. So we see, I see, I hope you see, a connection between service and worship. God's warning to the Israelites before they went to the Canaanites um, not to serve, worship, or serve their gods. Um, Canaanites, I, I, I haven't done any research on how they worshiped their gods. I know some of it regarded uh, involved sacrifices. Some of them um, involved sacrificing their children to their, 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 their God um, for the promise of prosperity and, and such. So um, in the sight of God, their practices were ab- ab- abominable. And so God warns them, do not do like them. Do not be like them. Do not worship their gods or serve them. Because God knew that, their, that worship of their gods was going to be detrimental but it's also going to detrimental to them personally, but also and their families if they're sacrificing their 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 kids, but detrimental to their eternity. So um, the Old Testament word for serve 
is translated serve, service, work, uh, can also mean bond service. So we kind of get the idea, Old Testament and New, of the word serve to be like a bond ser ser servant where you willingly give yourself to serve. You're not forced in, in, into it. Um, so this is the uh, a, kind of a, a base on which I want to continue this teaching. Um, in the tabernacle, when God instituted the law, he gave the priests and the Levites certain duties. And those duties had to do with maintaining uh, the, the tabernacle and the temple. Everything in it had to do with sacrificing animals daily, by the way, evening, morning, and e evening, um, besides all the other sacrifices for the people, for festivals and such. Um, so they had a they had a pretty big job. When you think about a million plus people, that's that's a lot of sacrifices. If the people are truly con con confessing their their sins and offering the sa sa sacrifices for it, um, okay. But before the tabernacle and the temple could be used. The high priest had to, first of all, be consecrated himself, but then he had to consecrate the tabernacle. And that was a series of, of sacrifice and putting blood here and there and other places. And, and I think it had something to do with water as well. Um, but there was a process by which the tabernacle and the temple were consecrated. Um, they were a place designated by God to be the place of worship. These places were consecrated, separated out, and made holy by the high priest to be a place where holy God would meet with his people. The priests had a lot of work to do. Um, their service to the Lord in maintaining the temple and the things that were in it as an act of worship Offering the daily sacrifices and the offerings for the people was part of their service of worship. This service of worship, this links us back to um, Romans chapter 12. We'll get there in, in a bit. I actually wrote that down here somewhere. Um, okay. So that kind of gives an idea, not a complete picture, but an idea of some of the things that the, the priests and the Levites had to do in order to worship God. They had things they had to do. This was part of their worship. What else did they do? Well, here's a list of things that they had to do, but also the layman had to, to do, just the average average. Uh, Joe, or whatever the equivalent of Joe would be in Hebrew. Um, obedience. Oh, there's a big one. Worship would have included obedience, which meant everything that God said was said to do, his commands was part of worship. Fearing God, loving God and neighbor. Offering sacrifices, confessing sin, thanking God with a grateful heart. Free will offerings, celebrating the prescribed festivals and feasts. Remembering God and all that he's done. Rehearsing and telling their children about all the things that God had done. How about singing? They sang too. They had people that wrote songs. So... We're doing good in the singing department. I think it, it, was, it was also the, the duty of the priests to communicate to, I think it was Moses at first, obviously, but it became the duty of the priests, the Levites, to teach the people. That was part, part of their, their duties too, acts of worship. Uh, taking care of widows, orphans, 
These were acts of service that showed that they worshipped God. And they were acts of obe obedience. Um, I want to try to make a distinction, and, and hopefully as, as I go, go along, I'll be able to um, keep that distinction clear. The word worship in itself shows action. So bow down, prostrate yourself, uh, reverence God, humble your, your, yourself. So I want to make a distinction between those things which are, are right and good from those things that are service. And I'm not sure how to make that distinction other than there are things that God has commanded us to do that are an outflow of worship from our hearts. Hopefully I can expound on that here in a, in a bit. Um, so the action of bowing down, is it in itself worship? It could be. It may not be. Worship is an action of the heart that results in physical manifestations of true worship. So if, if in our hearts we are truly in a, I'm going to use the word posture, if, if our hearts are in a posture of worship before God, knowing who he is and that he is worthy of that worship. And because of knowing who he is and the fellowship we have with, with him, that in it, coming from within us will exhibit, be exhibited in our actions. We're going to do the right thing. We're going to, we may bow down. We might prostrate our, our, ourselves. We will sing. Um, if we say we worship God, but never have the action to go along with it. It's not true worship. Likewise, if we have actions of worship, but our hearts are far from the Lord, it's not true worship. Um, that, that reminds me of, uh, in the book, book of James, uh, James says, faith without works is dead. So, you got actions of worship. It looks like you're worshiping because you're bowing down. You might have your hands raised. You may be singing, but what's your heart condition? So, faith without works is dead. I believe that worship without action is not true worship, but we can also get hypocritical about it and show the action without the, the heart posture. I want to look at uh, Isaiah 29.3. Well, that's not right. Okay, it's not it. Anyway, the, uh, uh, the verse basically says that you do all these things, you offer sacrifices, you claim to know me, you, with your mouth you say that you love me and you worship me, but you're, you have removed your heart far from me. So where are our hearts are our hearts in a position of seeking him, looking at him for him? The song talked about seeking him. Is that our posture, our heart posture? By, by the way, I, I realize by the end, I'm, by, the, by the time I'm done with this, I'm probably going to ruffle a few fe feathers. And, and I know I will because some of mine were 
ruffled as well throughout this, this past past week. So um, please know it's not it's not me. It's the Lord. It's not me wanting to ruffle feathers. Um, okay. Probably already said some of this, but I'm just going to read read what I what I've got here. Action. Bowing down, prostration, etc., is an indication of what's in the heart, but the action in itself is not worship. We can bow down and not sincerely worship, but it does not, but it does. 13, thank you. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to take the time to go search, searching for, for it, so thank you. Um, yeah, well, I got the three right and the 29 right. Okay, verse 13, then the Lord said, because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. So, we can get into a a groove, a rut, or whatever you might want to call, call it, where this is what we do. I mean, we come here, we sit, we sing, we listen, we go home, you know. Maybe we talk to pe- pe- people. Maybe that's part of our our rut, you know. I don't know. Um, I'm not saying those things are bad. Please understand me. But it, why are we doing it? I have wondered so many times, standing up up here, leading, thinking, why are we singing these songs? Do they mean anything to us, or are they just words? If they're just words, what's the point? We're going to get a minute into, never mind, I'll get there when I get there. I tend to bounce around too much. Um, Okay. We need to guard ourselves against hypocritically giving the impression of worship in order to make people think we're spiritual. That's a danger for us because we want people to like us. We want people to think we're spiritual. So let's be on guard about that. Um, When it came time for God to judge Israel for her sins, he came down especially hard on the priests and the Levites. Because the responsibility of leadership and the service of worship for the people was bearing down on them. It was their job to make sure that everything regarding public worship was done and was done correctly by his law. So when God had enough and was judging Israel, he came down especially hard on the priests and the Levites because of this. They would stray away from, from, from God and lead people astray. Now, they couldn't make people worship or not worship God, but you know that if their heart strayed from the Lord, the peoples would follow too. At some some point, so true with the uh, heart of 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 a king of a nation. Um, this is also why it says in James three one that teachers will incur a stricter judgment because the weight for We're not responsible for you to worship God, but we're responsible for the structure in which we can provide a place and a way for you to worship. The teaching that we give, if it's not rightly divided and it's not truth from the scriptures and we're just kind of winging it as we go, then our judgment is is stricter. Um, Okay, so going back to 
having a posture of worship. And the difference between heart worship and um, hypocrisy. I want to look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were commanded to bow down and worship the golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They refused to obey the king, which would have normally ended in death, and the king tried to end it in death. Could they have not have just bowed down, said, okay, I'm not worshiping God with my heart. I'm just going to do this so I don't die. Could they have? There were probably many Hebrews out there that were bowing down because they didn't want to die. They were probably not worshiping with their hearts, but they didn't want to die. So they, they, they bowed. They prostrated them, th- themselves. Um, bowing down is a physical posture of worship therefore giving the impression of actual worship. But action meant something. Bowing down meant something to these three men. It was evidence of their obedience to the king. It was evidence of them honoring something above their own God. They didn't want to give that impression. They didn't want to give the king or their God. They didn't want to offend their God. God knew their hearts. Would, could they have bowed and only in physical form and not with their hearts? Maybe, but wow, look what God did. Because of their reverence, because of their fear of, of their God, look what God did. Uh, they didn't want their actions to show honor to anything but their God. They didn't want God even having the appearance of coming in second to anything else. All right, so we're down to who. Who should be worshipped? Who is worthy of worship? This is a very short section. Our God. Okay, next. <clears throat> which is the real question why why is he why is he the only one worthy uh i don't remember what it says i've just got the the verse wrote down here isaiah 44 6 through 8 some of you may all may still be in isaiah uh isaiah Why is our God alone worthy to be worshipped? Verses 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. There is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Job 40 and 41. We're not going to read both chapters um, but that it's, it's God talking to Job and saying, were you there when the foundations of the earth were created? Were you there? Did you, did you see the, the border that was placed for the oceans? It says, go no further. Were you there? And God just lists a whole bunch of things. All rhetorical questions that deserve a no 
answer. You know, of course I wasn't there. God making a point. I was there. I'm the one. I'm the one who put it all there, and it's all by my word. Okay. <clears throat> he is, he is worthy. He is the only one to be that is worthy because he is Elohim, the creator of all things, the one who made us in his own image and breathed life into us. He is Yahweh or Jehovah, if you prefer, the only sufficient one. Contrary to the belief of some, God does not need our worship. He's not dependent on us to give him affirmation so he can feel good about himself or stroke his ego. He is sufficient within himself. We are made in his image, but needing affirmation is not one of the things that he needs. Um, worship is for us and for our relationship with him. Another reason, more reasons. Um, he is the only holy one without sin, without deficiency. He is the one who holds all things together by the word of his power. He is the one who sustains every living being and allows us to wake up each day. He is the only one who knows the end from the beginning and causes his own prophecies to be fulfilled. He is the only true God. All others are false gods. He is the only one who truly loves. Some might worship possessions. But they can neither see, nor hear, nor smell, nor satisfy. And when you get them, it's not quite enough. I want a little bit more, right? Um, people, movie stars, athletes, music stars, they're all sinners. And some of them are really messed up. Do we want to be like them? And of course, our favorite God, ourselves, seems like, maybe you're different than me, but it seems like I am the one that's on my mind most of the time. Uh, we are probably the recipient of most of our thoughts, time, and energies. And in the end, we all let ourselves down. So we're not really adequate God's ourselves okay you could probably list eight or ten dozen more reasons why but I'm stopping there um, so I have another why question why worship why worship at all well I, I, I believe it's why we're created uh, the the catechism, and there's like a bunch of them out there, Westminster, the lesser, the greater, and maybe they're all formed off of one uh, that said, hey, let's add this, and let's add that. And Anyway, um, question number one, what is the chief end of man? Anybody answer that? To, to glorify God and Enjoy him forever. What better form of worship than to glorify God and to enjoy him forever? Um, worship with God. Worship of God. It enriches our fellowship with him. What greater honor than to fellowship with the creator of all things? It's best for us. Worshiping anything else leads to an eternity separated from him. I have a slightly embarrassing confession to make. Uh, somehow, oh, there it is. It's at the bottom of my page. I flipped it over and I missed it. Um, 
when I was studying for, for this, <clears throat> this random song just pops it into my head. Anybody that knows me well enough knows that I've got a song in my head all the time. I'm whistling, I'm humming, I'm, I rarely sing out loud in public, but um, uh, so I, this, this random song just popped into my head, kind of sort of in the midst of studying for, for this, and it's Bob Dylan's song, Gotta Serve Somebody. You all heard that song? No? So uh, apparently Bob Dylan at one point in his life made a commitment to Christ and be, became a, a believer. I haven't re really heard anything about, about him uh, much since then. So I hope he's still following God. But in this song, I think it was an attempt to um, communicate something to his fans. Well, I don't know how much time left. Um, communicate something to his fans about God that, that they could relate to, maybe. So the, the main part of the lyrics in the chorus is, you're going to have to serve somebody. The grammar is terrible, um, uh, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And where I, I understand what he's trying to say, what he is saying, I think it's falling short of truth. And that is the truth that I see in reality is we are serving somebody. It's not you're going to have to, but you are question is who? Who are we ser serving? <clears throat> it was at that point I thought, serving? Serve? Why would it? <sighs> worship would be better. A better word for that spot. You're going to have to worship somebody. So that's when that's when I went back to Exodus 20 <laughs> and 23 and it said worship and serve. Do not worship them or serve them. It's like, what? They're connected. This is awesome. So, to, to my, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm going to say it was God. I was going to say to, my, to my, my shame, utilizing lyrics to a, to a song to get my point, my point across. But uh, I, th I think God led me to that song because it, it, it really caused this to gel, at least in my mind. I, I hope it is in your mind as, 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 as well. We're serving somebody. question is, who? We're worshiping somebody. But who is it? Uh, okay, we're down to how. How are we to worship well, according to Scripture, that's my first response. But I also want to acknowledge that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. As the Levitical priests consecrated the tabernacle and the temple to make it holy unto God for the service of worship, Jesus, our high priest, has consecrated us to be a holy temple for the living God. Made holy unto God for the service of worship. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 6.19 Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own 2 Corinthians 6.16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And Romans 12.1, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living, a holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. We were created and then saved to be a place where God's spirit dwells. So, it is on us to treat our bodies, our minds, as the temple of the Spirit. What do we put in it? 
What are we listening to? What are we watching? What are we thinking about? What do we, what do we allow our minds to dwell on? I know for me, I'll get there later. Um, so there are many aspects of worship that involve every part of our lives. So in what way can we put action to our worship? We need to go to the scriptures, see what God says, believe what God says, then act on what he says. So what does he say? Love him, love our neighbor. We can't, we can't love God if we don't love our neighbor, First John. We can't worship God if we don't love him. We're not going to worship him if we don't truly love him. Believe what he says is true. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So what, what I'm re- reading here are aspects of worship in our lives, things that we can do, the evidence that we are worshiping God with our lives. Not just doing something like bowing down or singing a song. This is, this is putting action, putting life into the worship that we have in our hearts for our, our living God. Repentance. <clears throat> putting him first in all things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Surrendering our own will to his will. Presenting our bodies a living and holy sacrifice to him. Acknowledging him in everything we do. I think that's somewhere in Proverbs. Or is it Psalms? Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Doing everything as unto him. Obedience. Did I already mention obedience? There's obedience. Awareness of God's presence every day. Awareness of God's presence. He's, he's in us, but he's, he's right here. Everything we, we involve ourselves in affects our relationship with him because he's in us. Am I going to take God to fill in the blank? Am I going to go this place knowing that God's right there with me. You you spend enough time thinking about it, it can be scary. Um, Not being anxious for anything because we know he's taking care of us. Making decisions that would please him. Living life, making decisions, how we treat other people, running our business, loving our spouse, raising our children in a way that is obedient to Scripture and that honors God. Well, here's, here's a few that are a little late in the game. How about reading the Scriptures? There's a good one. But not, not just reading it and going, okay, read it, what's next? You know, let's take some time to apply it. And I think I'd, I'd rather read one verse and apply it than read five chapters and just blow it off and go do something else. Um, prayer. Singing songs, of course. Setting our minds on things above. How about appreciation? Here's, here's a couple from the Old Testament that, that um, are, can be confused with emotion, but it's adoration and delight. These are, these are aspects, these, these are important aspects of worship, adoration and delight, delighting in him. Where is that? I have a part on, on emotions and I, was, I wanted to work that in, in together, but, oh look, there's a whole section I missed. Oh well. 
I'm supposed to do that one of the first things. Um, we just need to make, make sure that, that our emotions, people can get emotions mixed up with worship, right? We can leave here. I was playing these songs, and those words were just going through my my mind is like, man, I love these songs. And I don't know about you, but music really excites me. It, it naturally induces emotion in some people more than others. Some pe- pe- people can hear a song and go, okay, what? You know, but for me, words, melody, and Abby knows I just go off with all different variations of parts of songs and it just thrills my, my, my heart. It's just the way I'm wired. So I'm, I'm more inclined to be more on the emotional side of things and, and I have to guard myself against confusing emotion with worship. Worship can include emotion, but emotion is not necessarily worship so let's just be on guard with that uh okay a few more ways that we can show express worship to god gratitude thankfulness being eternally focused dying to self i got this thing too far in front of my mouth Trusting him for provisions and safety. That's one that didn't come to my mind until like one of the last things. I was like, well, yeah, I guess that belongs in there too. And trusting him with your, your whole life. You know, not just hmm. I'm out of time. Um not just the things that are important right now. The things that are important to me at this moment, those are the things I'm gonna trust God 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 with. He's got this. He's got all of life. And we tend to fret and worry about things that that don't matter. In eternity, it matters now. You know, how am I going to pay this this bill? Uh, I don't know. I'm biting my nails about it. Has God ever let you down? No, he's not going to start now. And the last thing I've got here is to live in what he's given us, to live in the victory over sin, live in joy, live in peace, live in love that he has granted to us very generously. Um, Okay, how am I going to sum this up? All right, we're going to get to when and when and where. When should we worship him? Somebody tell me. All the time. Yep. Out loud. You know, let's let's uh do it all the time. Wherever we go, whatever we do, where should we worship him? Everywhere. Um the Old Testament is um, uh, God. God t- commands His people, His the, the the parents, the fathers specifically, um, to train their children to tell them the things of the the law. When you rise up, when you lay down, when you sit, when you stand, when you go out the door, when you come in, tell them about God. Tell them what everything He's done. And this is this is. Not just preparing them for life, but it's being obedient, and it's part of worship. It's part of what we do to honor Him. Um, okay, the I got two things here. I I can't I can't I can't go on. I can't finish this without bringing up John chapter four. If you would turn to John four. Verses 23 and 24. 
I don't want to rush this, but I, I don't want to keep you all much longer. So what is true worship? <clears throat> John chapter 4, and probably many of you know what this chapter is about. But I want to focus in on verses 23 and 24. Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, An hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Do you know God is seeking you, wants you to come worship him? But not just to bow a knee. Sorry, got distracted. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God doesn't simply want people to bow down, to show a posture, physical posture of worship. He wants our hearts to be in a posture of worship. He wants us to worship him from our inner, innermost beings and with our spirits. Only then will our worship be in truth. It's truly worship if it's from our hearts, not just a physical outward action. Okay, uh, last thing I want to talk about is hindrances to worship. This is not one of the why, what, when, where, how. I just had to th th throw it in here because uh, our worship can be hindered. Um. Matthew 5, 21 through 24. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brothers, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore... If you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. What? First of all, there were several different types of offerings that the Jews did under the old law. In, in this statement, Jesus doesn't specify which offering it is, but all the offerings that the Old Testament Israelites did was an act of worship. So, Jesus didn't have to communicate which type of offering it was in order to get his point across. Whether it be a sin offering or a free will offering, presenting the offering was an act of worship. Even though the sacrificial system would soon be fulfilled by and in Christ, the principle still remains that it is difficult or maybe even impossible to worship God from our hearts if our hearts are weighed down with a bothered conscience regarding an offended brother or sister or any other unconfessed sin. So, hindrances, other hindrances, unforgiveness, unconfessed sin. I mentioned that one. Self-centeredness, selfish living, pursuing our own pleasures, lack of prayer, and what occupies our minds. I started saying this earlier, and I thought, no, I'm, I'm, it's got to... It's going to be in this sec sec section. I don't know about you. I am so bad to regret things, choices, decisions, things I said, things I didn't say, things I should have said, things I shouldn't have said. And if I allow myself, I will sink deep into just this mind-consuming 
pit. And I was talking to a brother one day about it, and he said, Joel, you can't do that. I'm like, duh, I know, but I don't know how to stop. So, things like regret. We can't stay there. I am learning how to conquer this. I have to redirect my mind, and this is something we have to do when our minds are focused on, well, so-and-so said this, and so I should have said this. Well, then they would have said that, and then I would say this. And, you know, it's like, well, what is that accomplishing? You know, that's just rising anger, resentment in your own heart. So what are we thinking about? What do we allow to occupy our, our minds? And, and a lot of it's not healthy. And a lot of it draws our attention away from the Lord. Like my regret, it, it draws my mind away from, draws me as a whole person away from worshiping God the way I'm supposed to. So whatever your regret is, whatever the thing that is in your, you tend to allow to occupy your mind and divert your attention and your thoughts um, away from God. You know what? We, we all have challenges. We all experience things in life. The question is, what are we going to do with it? Talked with a brother yesterday. His wife came down with an, an illness, and I said, I'm sorry. And he said, it's another opportunity to, to trust, trust God. I was like, oh, look at you. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. You know, just that perspective, that attitude. Um, okay. My conclusion. Let's be careful not to get into the mindset that since we've been to a worship service, that we have done what's expected. And then we head out the door to do our normal life stuff. For the believer, worship is normal life. The normal life of worship is living and doing all things unto him to honor him and to please him. Let's pray. Father, I want to... Uh, Thank you for the joy of being here today, doing what I'm doing. I thank you that you uh, are good and you're holy and you're worthy of all the worship of all the people of all time because you're holy, because you are our God, you are our creator, you are the one who has sustained, you created life and you sustain it. You hold all things together. We thank you for holding us together. Lord, draw our hearts closer to you for true worship in spirit. God, I ask that you bless us as we go. Glorify your name in our lives this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would stand.